Hi, my name is David Zucker. I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the Cons of Complexes, the place for people who think. We have two policies here. We have two policies here, one fool at a time and no personal attacks. All right. Um, our format is as follows. First of all, we're going to, um, first of all, Charlie Paydock is going to announce the upcoming programs. Then we will have announcements of neighborhood or community interest. Those must be announcements, no speeches. And I will introduce the speaker who will talk for about an hour or so on the topic. Yeah. Then after that, we will have questions and answers. And once again, it's like Jeopardy. All questions must be in that form. No speeches. It comes next during the rebuttal with rebuttal period when Tim, our moderator, will portion out the time for person. And you can talk about anything you want to. We would prefer to rebut the speaker, but if not, you can talk about whatever you want during the time that during the two, three, or four minutes, or however much the two gives you. And after that, the speaker will get the last word, and then we have to be out of here by 7:45 in order to close so the restaurant may close at eight o'clock. Finally. Um, this three dollar fee will be collected from each of you if it hasn't been already, so that the college may defray its expenses. And this place does not it does not exist for its health. If you want to continue to, to meet here, that means that everybody's got to order either order something to eat or drink. You might as well order dinner or something else. All right, there, Charlie, take it away. Okay. Charlie. All right. Welcome to meeting number 3,721 of the College Complexes, the playground for people who think. As usual, I would remind you that we have two email groups, a Google email group and a meetup group. And there's instructions right at the center top for subscribing to either one of those you get one or two uh, updated messages per week, no traffic. Okay, again, please, I must request that everyone in attendance personally in the restaurant may keep down their conversations, at least during the presentation, because this background sound is picked up by the microphones. If you are attending by home, please put a red X over your microphone. Please put a red X right now over your microphone. Thank you for cooperation in this regard. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On June the 24th, we're having an academic professor with extensive credentials in the global warming issue. And we'll get a report for the International Panel on Climate Change. So it should be a good program uh, uh, for the environmental perspective. Transitioning into July 1st, we are having two programs in conjunction with the 4th of July celebration. On July the 1st, I will giving, be giving a presentation on my list what I have ascertained to be the 10 most important historical sites in the United States that I think if you have a family, you should bring your children. So that's my list. Everyone will be uh, invited to recommend one or more of their own sites that they think are important uh, in the history of our country. On July the 8th, we are having none other than George Washington himself will be attending the College of Complexes. And you'll be able to converse with him and ask him things about the Constitutional Convention, the Revolutionary War, and so forth. So on July the 8th, whether or not he chopped down the cherry tree and all that, July the 8th. On July the 15th, we're going to try something new. Um, we're going to listen to a recording at theatrical production of a, a letter written by Frederick Douglass to his former slave owner 10 years after he has escaped slavery in the South, specifically Baltimore. 
uh, they'll be, I'll be sending out some homework uh, that you can do in advance uh, on the history of slavery and emancipation in the United States. It's a topic in which I believe most people have very little working knowledge. So we'll be covering it in that regard. I'll be monitoring it and posing questions for discussion. We're gonna have somewhat of an open mic format. On July the 15th, or oh, that's, we've been the 15th to 22nd. Uh, we're gonna have Reverend Earp is gonna recently announced, Cornell West has announced that he is a candidate for president of the United States. So you will be able to learn um, via uh, Charlie as to what he seeks to, why he is running for this office. Uh, on July 29th, I see he's there this evening. Jonathan Martin will give us a half a dozen uh, literary productions of his, and he calls it the poetry of change. So we'll see what sort of change he wishes to precipitate in our nation and the world. Transitioning into August, uh, Jian Lee will be returning from our satellite campus, puts together rather detailed and thoroughly researched topics, and should be re-examining this uh, matter of AI, artificial intelligence. That leaves three dates open in August, the 12th, the 19th, and the 26th. So if you'd like to speak, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Um, the, uh, in terms of announcements, on Wednesday at one o'clock, there'll be a Zoom conference call of Illinois residents who are seeking passage of the Earth Bill 598, HR 598. So if you'd like to participate in that uh, event, please contact me, my emails on the college website. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. Take it away. We lost connection, Charlie. Are you there? Yes, at what point? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but you were probably recorded on the Zoom call. But uh, at this point, what we'll do is we'll uh, introduce our guests. And we we'll finish your George Washington announcement. Okay, and uh, all right, I'll go over it again quickly. July 15th, we'll be discussing the issue of slavery. Uh, July 22nd, we're going to hear about the president. He just recently announced the Cornell West. The 29th, we'll be talking the poetry of change. Uh, and on August the 5th, artificial intelligence. That leaves three dates open in August. All right. We're, you all set, Charlie? Okay, Dave, take it away. Let's get our speaker on the air. All right. Are there any more announcements of neighborhood or community interest? All right, hearing none, I'm going to introduce the speaker for the evening. Long old Andy Anderson, who's a, a veteran college regular, and he's going to talk tonight about censors, about censored stories, the blackout news stories of this year. And regardless of whether we all agree with Andy's ideas or not, he's a, a fascinating and a very provocative speaker and should be a very stimulating talk. So let's give it up for Andy Anderson. Use the microphone, Andy. Woo! It's going to be important you use the microphone tonight. Okay. It's uh, it's there. You could speak into this mic. Yeah, that's just speak into that mic. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Well, well you can leave. <laughs> no, you have to pick it up, please. <laughs> a little humor there to start off the night. Okay. <laughs> Can please I, pick up the microphone. Uh, please what? pick up the microphones. Yeah, a little. No, little. They can't <laughs> yeah, that's a bit. That's the way yeah, to go. Andy. That Sorry that about that. You, you want you want your mic? Can anybody hear me uh, speaking into a mic like this right now? Yeah. yeah. You can hear me in better, but you have to use the microphone. I am. Yeah, All right. Everybody in the room can hear me, Charlie. Your mic's full of Okay. 
Tonight's talk is going to be uh, Rick hand out the outline for tonight. I titled it um, the four, four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and Global Solutions. And it's based on what media in America don't tell us. Now, this is one of my favorite books from 2004. It's a compliment to the censored news books that come out every year. This book is called Into the Buzzsaw, and it describes how reporters get fired and blackballed for trying to report something that would be of interest to the American people. So uh, this one is a classic. You can still order it online. Barnes & Noble can still get it, I think. But a lot of the things we're going to be talking about tonight on blacked out subjects, Barnes & Noble is claiming they can no longer order the books. You can order them from Amazon and get them in a day or two, but Barnes & Noble, both stores in my area, claim they're not in the system, they have no, they have no listing and can't order them. So there is censorship creeping up on us all over the country. The first, hold on. I think the first subject on that list is uh, big agribusiness. There have been a lot of stories. Hold on one sec. We're going to try to maintain some kind of order here tonight so that we don't run over on the time. I got a timer here that will we'll go 12 minutes per segment and have plenty of time for questions and answers. So I'm, um, there's three sites that I check every every day, Common Dreams, Truth Out, Smirking Chimp, or Smirking Chimp posts first, Common Dreams started posting second around nine o'clock, Truth Out is third. A fourth one is uh, The Guardian, but they will report uh, those first three sites, Common Dreams, Smirking Chip, and Truth Out, are reader supported. There's no commercial advertising, no pop ups. They're printer friendly. And I've got a, a bunch of articles here that we'll hand out during the question and answer for anybody that wants them. I'm just not going to, you know, dump $50 worth of paper on everybody and let it go in the trash because some of you aren't interested in some of the things. So during the questions and answers, speak up and say, do you have a reference paper on that or that? We have several on the military. We have several on the environment. Uh, also, those four things that are listed. I'll follow the outline myself. Um, there's been a lot in the news recently. About big agribusiness uh, cutting down rainforests. Uh, rainforests used to be considered the lungs of the planet where they would give us back oxygen. Now, with all the burning of the rainforests and trees everywhere, the rainforests are considered a source of pollution rather than the lungs of the planet anymore. And this is not being covered by mainstream media at all, as far as I can tell. Because it's billionaire agribusiness that want to buy up the land uh, and cut down the trees and uh, go for cattle farming and other big forms of agribusiness. In America, it's uh, ConAgra. What's the other big uh, Monsanto with uh, genetically engineered seeds? Archer Manual. Archer Manual. Archer Manual. Archer Thousands and thousands and thousands of small farms have been gobbled up by these conglomerates. And they, uh, if you didn't know, there are studies showing that if animals are given the choice between genetically engineered corn or uh, regular organically grown corn, 
they'll ignore the genetically engineered corn from Monsanto and the others. Animals can tell the difference between uh, you know organically grown natural things and the chemicals that are in there. So all I can tell you is um, log on to uh, well, there's several sites that have organic farming uh, updated news. There's a revolution in what's called organic farming going on all over the world, but that's mainly by uh, small and some medium-sized farmers, but it's being uh, resisted by big business, big pharma, and the ones that uh, control the price of seeds and fertilizer all over the world. The idea is to get farmers hooked on fertilizer and that is one of the main things, the wash off from fertilizers that going into the streams downstream and a uh, major source of pollution, killing fish. Uh, Mississippi dumps into the, the Gulf of Mexico down there and you have all kinds of, they're becoming dead zones for fish now. Going so to the next one. Um, big oil. We've seen it. The, final, the fossil fuel industry is using what we call the tobacco strategy. And starting in about 1970, the tobacco industry uh, figured we can't tell people that cigarettes are not a hazard anymore. So now our primary product will be Dow. And so they started paying actors portraying doctors. And it's rumored that I don't know for sure because uh, I haven't researched every doctor, but it looked like there were some regular doctors that were paid to say, uh, I take a break, uh, Camels is refreshing, or my doctor smokes Chesterfields. Virginia Slim uh, advertised to women especially. This is in 1970, they said our, our primary product is doubt because there's no longer any way to combat the body of facts. And they, um, they, several other industries have developed using that technique. Now, uh, Exxon Mobil, Exxon did their own studies on uh, pollution. Uh, carbon dioxide, CO2 going into the air. Exxon pretty much the program that is, they produced studies in the 80s showing how high the temperature would be, how, how the globe would be forming. Exxon knew almost 40 years before now what our climate would begin to look like with the continued burning of fossil fuel. But as it says on there, you know, we have a billionaire predator problem in this country. And once billionaires get so big that they don't have any concern for the environment or the safety of people or health or anything else, they just want more money. One of the articles I have here is it talks about the psychological problems, the mental health problems of, of billionaires and the way they look at the world. And it's, it's not just greed anymore, it's a mental health problem. And uh, other countries are beginning to face this also. The oil companies, if, uh, if those of you that didn't know, there's a, there, hold on. I'll stop every now and then to pick up a book. I brought several books here that uh, describe in book form what we're talking about. Here's one that's called fighting for God, that's gold, oil, and drugs. Basically, that's what the military is fighting for around the world. Oil, drugs, and various sorts of uh, gold or other mines, keeping the third world safe for American billionaire-owned businesses. And for those of you that haven't studied the forensic evidence of 9-11 that is overwhelming now, uh, Cheney and Bush in the media 
sold us the idea that we were attacked by Muslims so that we could go hunt for terrorists in oil rich countries. One, one scholar said, if we wanted to take over the oil fields of Norway, we would have attacked, been attacked by 19 crazy Norwegians. Every piece of what we were told about 9-11 is wrong, but it's been the driving force for the oil companies to continue using the US military. It's a symbiotic thing. The US military, the contractors, Raytheon, Boeing, everybody that sells to the military, they make an enormous amount of profit in wartime by defending the oil fields for our oil companies. And that's, that's what's been going on. If somebody trying to type in, Tim, I'm hearing about a bunch of crosstalk there. That's all set. Um, so, you know, talking, talking about 9-11 uh, being a, an enabler for the oil companies and the military to both just get filthy rich, like welfare for billionaires, hundreds of billions of dollars going to both of them every year. Well, incidentally, the oil companies are not a competitive business. The oil companies are sub subsidized in America. The oil companies are subsidized to the tune of $11 million a minute of taxpayer dollars. So anybody ever hear that figure? $11 million a minute subsidies propping up the oil companies who are charging us ungodly amounts of money at the pump? Well, that's where we are. Our billionaires are running a stable of intellectual prostitutes in Congress that vote for welfare for the billionaires. And the recent study came out a month ago that said investing in a US Senator uh, or a, a Supreme Court judge like Clarence Thomas, that's one of the best investments a billionaire can make. They can pour a few million in there and that, that investment will come back to them tenfold, 20-fold, 50-fold. That's where we are today with uh, our wholly owned Congress owned and operated by billionaires, with the exception of about a hundred people or so that call themselves progressives that aren't taking billionaires' money. And many of those progressives are getting death threats every day for trying to help the American people. But that's a subject for a whole other night. There's uh, we could do a whole night on any one of these four if we delved into it deeply, but the over the overriding, uh, overarching problem over all, all of this is billionaire predators that pay people to pass laws that deny health care. Uh, the, the Republicans in states now are trying to call themselves Republicans. They're passing laws or trying to, to get rid of school lunches for poor kids. Now, now who, who would want to take away school lunches from kids? Well, that's more money for the billionaires. That's what that, you know, the billionaires look at social security or school lunches or anything else as like, that's a source of income that's, that's going to need people that are just, they don't really need it. They're, uh, they're useless either. We should have that money. And the gap in the last 20 years, especially since Trump got in office, the gap between the rich and the poor in America is greater than the gap between the the poor people in Egypt when the pharaohs walked the earth. So this is the greatest gap the human race has ever seen from the people at the top having more wealth than God really and the people at the bottom, homeless, you know, red, many cities in, uh, in, in all over the country now, you can't afford rent. Wall Street bankers are buying up property. They're, they're paying 20, 30% more than the value of the property apart from houses and everything. And then they evict you who is there and just double the rent. And if you, if you can't pay the rent, well, just live under a, a viaduct somewhere or die. We don't care. Um, that's the message from the billionaire. But one of the things on the subject of oil, Rocky Mountain Institute published, if you, you, know, you ought to write that one down if you're all not familiar with checking on rmi.org, Rocky Mountain Institute, just check it once a week for the latest update of what's going on all over the world and people that are replacing oil with cheaper alternatives. 
It's common knowledge now all over the world that solar and wind power are cheaper than oil. But what people don't realize is that in 1980, Volkswagen had a 98 mile per gallon diesel rabbit that would go coast to coast on one 30 gallon tank. All the car companies have known how to make 100 mile per gallon vehicles since 1980. There's no, they're just, they're not made in America and uh, high mileage vehicles are not for sale in America. Other companies are making 60, 70, 80, and even some that approach 100 in foreign countries, but not here. They want a, a percentage of our paycheck every month. Just like, I don't know how many people I've talked to in the suburbs that have never heard about the houses in Chamber with no furnace that heat for 10 bucks a month. The two words, no furnace, just don't appear in a print in the parade of homes in Chicago because they want builders to keep building houses that are as obsolete as eight track tape players, floppy disk drives, that kind of stuff. Furnaces have been obsolete since 1978, but the people in Illinois don't know about it. But you just, all you have to do is just spend the furnace money on the walls and windows when the place is built. You make the house look, make a thermos bottle, look like a house. You live in a thermos bottle shaped like a house and it heats for 10 bucks a month and you got a fresh air filter that brings in fresh air. 24 hours a day, two little bathroom fans, stale air is exhausted out through it. So that kind of a house costs the same, looks the same as an ordinary house. You just have better walls and windows. And it heats for, in today's dollars, that would be a $20 a month heating bill. It was $10 a month back around 1980. But in today's dollars also, that kind of a house can be run off a few square yards of solar cells on the roof. Solar energy to, to replace oil and to replace all kinds of fossil fuel Solar energy has dropped in price from $2,100 $2, in 1978, 80 to $100 today. 100 bucks today will get you the same cost, same system, same amount of electricity that you would got for you know $2,100 back in the 80s. That's how the price has gone down, just like cheap cell phones, DVD players. It's a total revolution in progress. So. That's where we are with big oil. Big oil is controlling the press and keeping the news of high efficiency houses, high efficiency cars, anything that uses gas or oil. The beneficial solutions are basically suppressed by the American media. Now you can only suppress something for so long until enough of the public finds out that it's everybody knows about it. The third one on the list there is a big military. Big no, as I said, the rest of the world knows, the world knows that the US military is simply the largest killing machine on the planet. With fossil fuel and all kinds of other things that it burns, the footprint of 800 bases around the world and the activities in our forever war economy. The US military is considered the largest single polluter and the largest killer of people all over the world. Smedley Butler, Marine General from 1935, he wrote a book called War is a Racket. He said, draw a two-mile circle around the United States. We don't have to have our troops meddling in foreign countries, you know, to keep Keep the third world safe for United Fruit Company, Standard Oil. Any any people that would object to us stealing their resources and not paying them a fair share. Well, Butler's book has been published several times, republished since 1935, but I talked to a lot of people in the military, a lot of people in the Marines, never even heard of it. And Butler was the most famous Marine general in history. So the knowledge uh, Medea Benjamin is a longtime protester of the war, runs a group, runs a group called Code Pink. And uh, they point out, that's all right, I'll give it. But uh, what's happening now, it started in the fall of 18 with one girl, Greta Thunberg from Sweden. 
And she woke up and says, what am I doing if I have no future? What am I doing in school if I got no future? Well, tens of millions of kids and adults have followed her into a bunch of groups all over the world. It's not just her anymore or her group. There's a group called Extinction Rebellion that periodically has a couple hundred thousand people protest and shut down some streets in the center of London. And they, they just sent a message to, to the people in London, the, the city fathers, in other words, they said, if you don't start doing something about climate change and get real, the protests are going to get bigger and more aggressive. And we're going to, we're going to shut down businesses, just clog the streets with bodies. And so far, no government has seen fit to do what Richard Nixon did with the National Guard in 1970. Just fire a few rounds into those protesters, kill a few of them and send them a message like they did at Kent State. Those of you that are old enough to remember Kent State. Well, so far, the billionaires have figured out that if you kill one seventh grade girl protesting for her future, there's gonna be a thousand others run right out of middle school and stand right where she was. You wanna make that protest 10 times, 50 times bigger, just start killing. So, you know, the, the numbers are getting large and uh, they're, they're working with climate scientists that have computer models that have been wrong. I, I don't know if any of you have been aware, but the climate scientists that are protesting, pro projecting the future have been saying for the last couple of years, our models are wrong. Our models are wrong. We've been wrong for 10 years. Well, the reason they've been wrong is they've been underestimating how fast it was happening. Elizabeth Colbert uh, published a book in 2016 or something, and she recently had an article like you know five years ago. She said, when I last wrote about this, we thought the ice at the South Pole would be melting around the year two, uh, you know, 2100. We thought it was 70 or 80 years away. Big chunks of icebergs, hundred, you know, thousands of cubic miles of ice going into the ocean. We thought that was happening 80 years from now. What's well, happening now? Our, our computer models were off by 70 to 80 degrees. There's, they're saying uh, several other government leaders have said also, we don't talk about this as global warming or uh, uh, climate change anymore. It's a climate crisis. It's an absolute crisis all over the world. And that's, that's the number one story that the press is not covering sufficiently, they're, they're downplaying it. They're making it look like, oh, it's a problem, but we have more time. You know, they're, they're not alerting people to the fact that we could lose most coastal cities by 2050 at the rate the ice is melting, if we don't get our act together. So uh, many other countries are uh, really shifting into high gear, getting off fossil fuel. Of course, I am in heating and air conditioning business and our, our furnace manufacturers say, they haven't heard anything. They have not heard a peep about the cities that are changing their building codes. You won't be able to build a new house and run gas pipes into it. New houses are going to be non-fossil fuel. They're going to be all electric. And just like the, if you do a Google search, there's a bunch of uh, companies making electric cars now. You know, some are more affordable than others, but it's like the early cell phones. Cell phones were $1,500 when they first came out. Doctors and lawyers and drug dealers are the only people that can afford to have a cell phone, basically. Now, they're 30, 40, 50 bucks. Anybody can have a cell phone. And the knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. And once you, once you reach a certain point, like today, today you can't have an honest debate over whether breathing asbestos dust is a health hazard. The answer is no. I have a friend from the Navy retired he said, you know, he, he's in the asbestos removal business. But, you know, 1959, 1960, they were putting asbestos in walls, ceilings, pipe insulation. They knew asbestos was a killer in 1918. And they covered it up to make the profits. It's just big money in motion. That's what we're looking at. There's so, uh, so many more things you could say on that. Um, I, I imagine we're gonna have some questions and answers. Oh, excuse me, let me, let me start with my phone. I forgot to turn my cell phone off like we're supposed to do it in a theater or some someplace polite. 
how polite the con co college of complex is is uh, debatable some night, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make the effort anyway. Um, but um, I brought some books to show tonight the difference like before and, and after what was what they believed 50 years ago on some things versus what's known now. Yeah. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Last thing on the list that we'll spend a few minutes talking about is big pharma. Some of you may, have any of you heard of the bus rides uh, into Canada that Bernie Sanders takes? He takes a busload of elderly or senior citizens or disabled people across the Canadian border to buy life-saving medications for 10% of what they cost in America. Well, we're coming to the end of the line of the charade that American drug companies have to charge huge money because they have to recover their R&D costs. There's an article here that said, you know, uh, big, big pharmaceutical, and big drug companies are killing people for profit. That's a headline of an article that came off, right off the Common Dreams. It's profitable to kill people with certain kinds of drugs. You put out a drug and if it only kills 5%, but you make billions off the others, it's okay to sell it in America because they have immunity, sort of. You can't sue them. As far as, I, as, far as I'm able to determine what I've read, we're the only country, the only modern country on the planet that allows drug companies and hospitals to say to sick people, well, I'm sorry you can't afford the treatment. I mean, I'm sorry you're going to die, but we need our billions. You know, that's the message. You know, they, they say actions speak louder than words. Well, what are the, on the four horsemen on this list, what are these people, these big billionaires telling us? Agribusiness. Well, we're sorry we're polluting and destroying the soil, and after a few years, you can't grow much there because the soil is depleted. But we're making billions. We'll just move on and cut down more rainforest. No big deal. Big oil. Well, we're very sorry that you can't drink the water out of your wells anymore after we got through fracking for the gas. But we're making a bundle on the frack gas because it's being subsidized by the U.S. government. And we're going to make a bundle on selling you clean water because that's the new gold rush. You're not going to be able to drink your water anymore after we get through fracking these wells because it's, it's cross-contamination. Some people can light a cigarette layer and the water coming out of their kitchen tap near a frack well, you can light the water on fire. It looks you know, almost like antifreeze. But, you know, it's nothing personal. I mean, we didn't contaminate your water on, 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 per, uh, on purpose. It's nothing personal. It's just we need our billions. And, you know, the, the, the water is just, you know, that's collateral damage. That's not our problem. It's your problem to clean it up as homeowners if you, if you can. Like Joe Lois Gibbs from Love Canal. That was just, she's, she's world famous now for being an environmental researcher about toxic waste dumps. And um, Aaron Brockovich became famous and then made a movie out of with her, her story. A big pharma is... Those people are classed by themselves. And let me let me read you something real quick. Just a sentence or so. This is this was published in 1995. The publisher of this book, they wrote. You know, sometimes a, a subject looks controversial, but they wrote, if Duisburg is right, and we think he is, this is going to be one of the great science scandals of the century. If he's right, and we think he is, the title of that book is called Inventing the AIDS Virus. 
Duisburg blew the whistle on him in 87. HIV was not the cause of what was making people sick. A lot of people were dying, but they weren't dying from HIV. And he spelled it out in this book. Hundreds of other doctors and researchers followed. That's, 19, that's 1995. Look at from 20, from 2021. Here's a book from 2021, recent. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. published it. It says, if Duisburg is right, AIDS would be an iatrogenic disease. Iatrogenic, look up the definition. Iatrogenic means doctor caused. AIDS would be a doctor caused pandemic and Dr. Fauci would be its author. Anthony Fauci as the head of the CDC oversaw the intentional poisoning of 300,000 people that were told they had HIV and AIDS, but they were given a fatal chemotherapy drug in a capsule that was labeled antiviral drug. 300,000 were cheerleaded by the AIDS doctors right in their graves because Burroughs welcomed the manufacturer of that drug. They took an old chemotherapy poison off the shelf from the 60s, sitting around with no patent. It was designed for short-term chemo, stop the growing cells all over the body. They put that in capsules and marketed it as an antiviral drug. And then the gay community was screaming, you know, we got to get drugs. It's the first drug Burroughs welcome. You can look it up, just like the tobacco industry knew back in 1935, or the asbestos industry knew about how their products were lethal. Burroughs welcome said, we're going to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to make billions because people will sell their houses, insurance policies, everything else to get their hands on this life-saving drug to stretch out their life a little bit until, they, until a better treatment is found. And he said, according, in addition to get, making billions, we're going to get rid of a whole generation of gay men because this will be 100% fatal. There'll be no survivors. And there weren't. Everybody that took it, according to doctor's orders, died. It says right in this book, the first dose, is if you took it at uh, 1,500 milligrams a day, you were dead in four months. If you stretched it out at you know, 500 milligrams a day, the lifespan got up to 24 months. The average lifespan of a person on ACT after they got pneumonia they went downhill and died in about 18 months. 300,000 were poisoned by the AIDS doctors. And the media, you talk about the media, the media gave us never ending coverage of that AIDS quilt. Did anybody here old enough to remember AIDS quilt? People were, um, you know, well, the media was telling us those people were dying of AIDS. When my Arthur Ashe, Arthur Ashe was poisoned by his doctor. He was healthy, but he just tested HIV positive. So the media has been in on these scams, these billionaire-owned scams, because the billionaires own and operate the media. Well, surprise. That's why you you can't certain certain things are just radioactive. You what we're just talking about here, this isn't in the major media because if any reporter tries to cover it, they get fired and blackballed. She got 18 stories in this book into the buzzsaw about Pulitzer Prize winners trying to cover stories like what we're talking about here tonight. And they all got fired and blackball one day when they didn't know that the story was really radioactive. So that, that's where we are. And the media today is in tighter control of billionaires. But since 1988, there's a new phenomenon on the horizon, something new. It, it started with Rush Limbaugh and Fox News at about the same time. And basically the idea is to bury the public in a 24 seven fire hose of bullshit to the point where they can't tell what's real and what isn't anymore, what's true and what isn't. And that, that, that's, uh, that was pointed out from the people that studied Germany. If you tell a big lie long enough, you just bury people in lies after a while, once they lose the ability to tell what's real and what isn't, they lose the ability to think critically. We have a third, we have about a quarter of this country, they're often a, a, a religious cult called MAGA land. And they can't think critically. And they vote for criminals. It's, it's you know, that's a whole, that's a, a whole other topic also. Um, if you support Father O'Malley and you don't know he's abusing the kids, you're not complicit in the crime. 
But if you're in law enforcement or anything else, and you hear about somebody abusing a child, and you don't do anything about it, uh, you can be complicit. And that's where we are today. We have a quarter of the country is complicit in voting for really some smooth talking criminals from Ted Cruz on down that are just passing outrageous laws. They want to get rid of women's right to vote. They already got women in, in the states, you know, women can't get proper birth control or medical, you know, uh, treatment for uh, bad pregnancies. Yeah, you know, just, we're sorry you're pregnant, but you got to carry that dead, dead baby till it gets born. And then, you know, if you're going to die, if you get close to death, we'll intervene then and we'll try to save your life. But we can't give you any life-saving treatment until you have proven that you're 15, 20 minutes away from dying in the hospital. That's the essence of treatment in some of these red states. But that's not on the news. No. But here's a little tidbit that might give you some of you a laugh. Harvard University is asking for Ted Cruz to return his law degree. That was on the news yesterday. I'm not sure uh, what, but, huh? <laughs> Yeah, 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 they're, yeah, they're, uh, they're saying Ted, Ted's a disgrace to the law profession and he should return his law degree. So, uh, you know, so, so slowly, you know, people wake up slowly over time. We got another 10 minutes, maybe. Now, hold on. Incidentally, um, I'm going to give away uh, one of these books to anybody that wants it, uh, uh, The State of the Free Press. This is a 2023rd edition. It's new. And uh, the number one story, the number two story in this one is wage theft. U.S. businesses, they suffer few consequences for stealing millions from workers every year. The number one sensor news, number one story in 2023, the fossil fuel number one story is the fossil fuel industry is subsidized at the rate of $11 million per minute. Welfare for billionaires, that's what we're looking at across the board on many different subjects. But Smedley Butler's book describes in peacetime, US steel might make 8% per ton selling steel to the military. In wartime, they can make 100%, 200% profit per ton on the same steel if it's being turned into bullets and tanks and everything else. As soon as you slop over into wartime, then the profits go up. And Butler's book spells out a lot of different industries and who the, who the winners are and who the losers are. And he said the losers are, are clearly the troops that don't get to see a penny of that money. And his, his troops, he took care of them the best he could as a leader. He said, my troops were scheduled to get eight boots during their time in the military. And he said, all they ever saw was one pair. Where the, where the profit and the other, you know, the, the government paid for eight pairs, they got one. And that's that's government contracting. And it's, it's just gotten worse since Butler's time. But, you know, my favorite is the new, is it an F-35 war jet? They, they made a new modern jet. It has the latest touch screen. It has like your touch phone. Picture this. They have instead of the old toggle switches, the old manual switches for computer and all in the cockpit of the jet, they got touch screens. And you're supposed to touch the proper thing for the flaps or what speed, whatever it is. Nobody ever thought to ask, how easy is it going to be to touch the touch screen if you're in a dog fight with a Russian MIG and your hands are moving all over like this upside down? The, the plane is unflyable in combat, and nobody and they spent billions on it. I mean, it's just it's well well we're looking at our country as the greatest welfare for billionaires system going that the planet has ever seen. We we can brag about it. We're number one. But I got started back in all oh, 1970ish or something. The early in 1971, this book was this book was published in 1971. John Goffman. John Goffman was he wrote a book called Radiation and Human Health. He's considered the father of modern radiation and health and uh, how 
people get sick from low doses, low level radiation. He was a co-discoverer of plutonium back in 1942. He wrote this book called Poison Power back in 1971, talking about what a fully operational nuclear power industry would give us in 3,300 cancer deaths every year. They asked him to do a report back in the 60s. He said, well, you know, they're just a peacetime operation uh, leaking out here and there, radioactive dust from the mines. We might have 3,300 3, excess cancer deaths a year. Well, the industry went nuts and they fired and they, they thought that was just outrageous. You can't talk about people getting sick from the pollution around a nuclear power plant. That would have nipped it in the bud. So the updated version came out of this just after Three Mile Island happened. And he, he spelled it out. He said, basically, nuclear power, a fully operated nuclear power industry is incompatible with human life on the planet, period. This book, Energy and War, came out in 1980, by, published by Amory and Hunter Lovins. They talked about the alternatives to nuclear war and the alternatives to uh, fighting over oil. Just the concept to do the cheapest things first. And they were talking about houses without furnaces, 100 mile per gallon cars, all kinds of things our society could have done if we didn't have billionaire predators. But Rocky Mountain Institute has grown. They don't. I don't see them in the news around here at all. But they're they've got operations going uh, in cities all over the world, helping third world countries put in mini grids. Uh, the solar solar wind and battery revolution is huge, and it's it's global. But you, you wouldn't know that because there's never any reference. There's never any reference to Rocky Mountain Institute at the Daily Herald or Sun Times or wherever you're looking. But there's good things happening all over the place. Um, well, I'm almost through here, and then we'll just take a bunch of questions. This movie, Spotlight, is one of my two favorites for teaching a concept. This the Spotlight was made, a movie was made out of the Spotlight newspaper investigation arm of the Boston Globe in 19, well, it was 2001, they started to investigate. They found three pedophile priests. They thought they had a story, and then they started to dig around, and uh, they ran across the guy uh, from in another state. He said, oh, didn't you know? They, they asked him, he said, does three pedophile priests sound about right for Boston, a city this size? And he says, no, it sounds a little low. He said about 6% of all priests are pedophiles. And the editor said, well, how many priests we got in Boston? 1,500. You mean there's maybe 90 pedophile priests here? We only found three. So they started to do shoe leather, old type uh, investigation, going to libraries, looking at the books, and they dug up all the annuals. They have like a good year, like a, a high school yearbook annual. There's a yearbook every year that publishes all the names of the priests and what parishes they were at, where they went, to rest for recreation where they were moved to another city. They found out that this was a whole thing of moving priests around so the public wouldn't get wise to it. But this movie is an Academy Award winner from 19, uh, 2015. It describes how people don't want to think about something that they don't want to think about. This, you know, and then, well, that's too bad to think about, so I can't think about that. But it describes how the lawyers that were settling the cases without going to court, they, 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 had a, they were settling with the Catholic Church. The church was paying $20,000 a year per molested child. And they, they, when uh, Rachel McAdams played uh, you know, the lawyer, that she went down to the courthouse to find the court cases. Couldn't find any. She said, there's nothing there. The church kept it out of the courts. The church had to pull to make a deal with the city fathers, whatever city they're in, the church said, we'll handle this in-house. We don't want you to file any you know, uh, reports legally against these priests. And that's how they covered it up. But this, just the way that the actors portrayed how you don't want to think about something until you have to think about it, 
it, it, it, it ranks right up there with the people that don't want to think about climate change. They don't want to think about a local company that might be dumping toxic waste. Certainly don't want to face the reality that we have some pharmaceutical companies that would make money off a drug. They won't pull it off the market until the knowledge spreads that too many people are dying. If, that, if they're able to keep it quiet, they'll keep making profits and hundreds, thousands of people die needlessly. Now, uh, we had something called, it was in Chicago, we had a Tylenol incident, didn't we? Back in the 80s, was it? Or yeah. when was that? So well, it was uh, Johnson and Johnson got right on that, right? They didn't wait for people to start dying, right? They pulled that off the shelf like that immediately. They did the right thing. But that was before Ronald Reagan and, and, and the, the idea that you just start packing the courts with right wing judges that will throw a case out. The courts are packed today with judges. Many, uh, many of the judges appointed by Trump, uh, the lawyers that never tried a case, they were groomed by the Federalist Society. Look that up. The Federalist Society identifies young people in college. And they, they give them uh, stipends, uh, internships, all kinds of things. They groom them right through law school. They help them through law school and everything, even though these people can't really think logically. Or, uh, but they're, they identify them as having no real ethics, morals, or conscience. They're willing to take money to make votes for billionaires. And our courts are packed with these people right now. Clarence Thomas is a shining example. Clarence Thomas is one of the forerunners, but there's five others. The Supreme Court has six intellectual prostitutes and three honest people, as far as I can see. And there's not much. Uh, well, John Roberts is uh, waffling in the middle, but he might he might he might not like to be called an intellectual prostitute. But he's got to get his stuff together and then start doing things that help. Anyway. The other, the last movie, before we go to questions and answers, the last movie I would suggest is, uh, is a, I think it was an Academy Award winner of, of some things. It was called The Accused. Jodie Foster and Kelly McGillis played two women in that movie. Jodie Foster was uh, assaulted and raped by some guys in a bar, and some other guys stood there and cheered and clapped in the back of a, a bar there with a pinball machine. Well. That movie describes how, you know, the rapist got prosecuted, but they made a deal. But Kelly McGillis, the lawyer said, I want to prosecute the people that cheered and clapped. And that's the concept. In England and other places, if you cheer and clap and egg somebody on that's committing a crime, you could be uh, accused and prosecuted as an accomplice. I'll tell anybody their face. If you vote for Trump, if you support him, you're, you're voting for criminals. You're part of the problem. You're in a cult. Now, how many people recognize they're in a cult and how many people uh, just like to vote for some guy that is a rapist? Now, that's a question that our society has to face because we have a lot of people that apparently don't see anything wrong with child abuse or women abuse. And, um. There's all kinds of articles the last two weeks that are studying the level of violence and the level of racist attacks and things has just gone up steadily in this country. Public discourse has disintegrated or gone down bit by bit in a lot of areas since Trump was allowed to masquerade as our president. He was installed through massive criminal activity. He didn't win the election in 2016. And he certainly got voted out in a landslide in 2020, but the press is still hesitant to call him a big liar. But now the criminal case is overwhelming. And once you read what's in there, there it is. So uh, that pretty much, I, I, on the back of that, if you just bruise this flyer at your leisure, you see that if we address the, if we address the problem with billionaire predators and start transferring that money. There's an article that showed if we transfer half of the military budget that's going down a rat hole, 
We have free college education, universal health care. Our country have all kinds of good things that we had back in the 50s. We had close to universal health care or it was affordable. We had nonprofit hospitals. We had virtually universal education where you know, college was affordable to anybody that wanted to work a summer job, basically. And then things started going downhill in the 1980s. And so it's been you know, 43 years later, the rest is history. We, and we, we have one, one party has been just totally taken over by people that are proven criminals. They're proven they want to do criminal things. If you're not a criminal and you want to help the American people, the Republicans don't want you. Like uh, Arlo Guthrie says in, in Alice's restaurant, he says, we don't like your kind. Well, we'll, we'll run, you know, if you're not like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert, if you're an honest person, we'll run somebody like her against you and we'll pour, the billionaires have poured more money into elections to get these crazy people elected since Trump. The, the, all the campaign money in the history of our entire country they're pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars into house seats in you know red states or borderline states. They're taking over houses state by state, and that that's one of the top ten subjects that's blacked out. You just don't see it in the press at all. But it's you log on to Common Dreams, Smirk and Chip, Truth Out. Those three sites, and you get a really good picture of what's going on. Well. That concludes my talk so far, and I guess we'll just open it up to questions and answers. All right. Uh, I will have a train. We have to do my moderate and you know, call out people. Or if you want to do it that yeah, way, that's well, fine. We, we'll try. All right. Uh, we can do it two ways. We're going to, the uh, people here, the, I'm going to have you repeat the question. I can repeat the question rather than pass the mic around. I'll just okay. repeat the question so everybody can hear. All right. Somebody's got his hand up back there. Our, our first one's Charlie Paydock. He's got his hand oh, up. Charlie's got his hand up first. Okay, uh, Charlie, go Charlie, ahead. What's your question? Ahead. Yeah. Um, let me get my picture up there. Yeah, Andy, thanks for the talk. Uh, the number of deaths in the United States from AIDS peaked in 1995. As a matter of fact, you just lost the college regular to AIDS. A lot of people didn't know that. But it peaked in 1995 and has been a decline precipitously since then because of ACT. As a matter of fact, within the past 10 years, the number of deaths, it, now there's no cure for AIDS, but the number of deaths has gone down. I just looked it up, 48%. Yeah. 48% decline in the number of deaths and is no longer considered a major cause of death in the United States. So what do you mean the treatments? There's no other explanation for this data than that there was an effective, at least the treatments for controlling its onset. Uh, can I answer your, your question, Charlie? Or uh, can I answer that? Okay, I guess Charlie's going to let me answer. The reason the death toll kind of yes, peaked and slacked off in 1995 was the, basically they stopped feeding uh, AIDS patients large doses of the poisonous AZT. When they stopped, uh, when AZT was moved overseas and they weren't feeding it to people here in large doses, they developed what they called a cocktail. It had far, far fewer toxic ingredients in it in smaller doses so people could tolerate it better and live longer lives. But they still have problems with the, the long-term toxicity of some of those uh, treatments. But Charlie is absolutely right. Uh, he, a number of people, the bulk of the people died from 87 to 95 because that was the years, the main years that the, the primary treatment was 100% fatal AZT. Everybody that took it those years, according to the doctor's orders, died. There were no survivors. That's well established. The survivors, the long term, everything else, what we see today is due to the fact that they have what they call maintenance drugs that uh, are not nearly as toxic. And uh, you can tolerate those for uh, years and years and years and years. And supposedly they'll, they'll help your other medical conditions. But that, that's a subject 
and I would be more than happy to discuss with the books from another whole night. If Charlie, I got a follow up. You have repeatedly maintained that there was no AIDS epidemic. Uh, that you have is, said that repeatedly. That uh, there, uh, there, there was, there was. Hold on, Charlie, just a minute. There, in fact, was an AIDS epidemic. This this doctor, Dr. Nancy Turner Banks, if you never read her book, she said we had an epidemic. We had an epidemic of international pharmaceutical greed. That was the epidemic. But the actual many, many doctors have said they've proven in court cases that AIDS is not, I mean, uh, AIDS is not a sexually transmitted disease with HIV. If you, if you get, somebody takes you to court for, you know, Contaminating them with HIV, you can prove in courts, and courts all over the world have been proving that HIV is not the cause of AIDS. Others That's dangerously done. wrong information. Thank you. Yeah. Dangerously wrong. I said I suggest you read up, Charlie. Let's go on to the next. I just did. question. All right. Next now question. Let's... I got a question. Okay. Okay. Don Loud, please. Listen, listen. Uh, you you said. <laughs> Well, uh, the National Guard was given, uh, you know, the go ahead to control that mob. And that was, you know, it, uh, what I read, it came down from Nixon's administration, whether Nixon personally called up on the phone and gave this, uh, gave the order to fire, or whether it was one of his lower authority henchmen, the, the Nixon administration, you know, fired on those people at Kent State. That wasn't an accident. Look it up. It was the National Guard. I'm sorry. I better run home. My wife is waiting. I got to plant the cucumbers before I get shot. I want to ask you that follow that book on the National Media and I'll bring it back in two weeks. I want to show you what it's about. Project censored? Or, uh, Which one is it? Second or third book, if you were uh, censored, what's the project? Maybe uh, something. What is going on at the college? Was it this one? Yeah, take that with you. That's a good one. I'll be back in two weeks. Okay, we'll see. Is this one of the better book? We'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Thanks, Bartles and James. All right, who's we, we next? Thank you for your support. Okay, Ellen, you're next. Ellen's got a question. Loud, Ellen. Okay. Regarding the issue of, uh, you know, the a HIV and the AIDS virus, I read a good bit about it, thanks to you as well, and reading Richard Hughes' book. And it, that concept is so important. It was discussed in the 90s, but it wasn't discussed in the news. And this is why, um, you know, we're so confused. Uh, you know, it, Judy Nikovich isn't in the news. She said that all the what we call viruses starting in 1980 were manufactured as the bioweapons. Uh, you know, they're, these are, and it, it does make sense, including the AIDS virus. And once you understand that, but anyhow, the, the question is, you know, uh, so there's also just the context of the uh, Dallas Buyers Club gives you a good insight. That brings me into Fauci and ABC. So Charlie might want to look at that movie of how it, people, once they understand that they are trying You're no doctor. You're no doctor. You have no credentials. We have to be able to say the virus word on TV. Get some credentials. Yeah, but we, since it's never been on TV, what's your question? Let me, let me right she has no question. This is Abby. A vaccine at a free speech forum. I don't know what we're going to do. You know, it's, okay. it's been censored by the FBI and the covert operations of Charlie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right, Andy, go ahead. Where's free speech? Is that not legal? Is that not doesn't it say it's not free delivery? The FBI can censor a free speech forum with a covert operation. There's no hope. I think it's a question period. 
the, the, the covert operations of the FBI would be uh, a subject that'd be a, a whole night topic. Are we allowed to talk about it? Hey, Charlie, can we talk about covert operations of the FBI? Can we schedule that someday in the near future? Apparently not. Okay, next question in the audience here. Okay, go ahead. Let me get, let me get, let me get. Big Pharma wanted to make money. Why would they sell drugs at two? Well, um, you, you, do, you don't start out killing your patients. Okay, let's say if you make a drug that's going to be a blockbuster uh, and it's going to make billions, but you're going to kill like five people out of a thousand. You know that uh, that's considered uh, a, a high number. If, you know, if you're not you're not supposed to kill uh, or have side effects. If something, I'm not sure. If somebody can look that up and you know do research on it. I don't know what the threshold is, but um, from what I'm reading, some of the current drugs they have have side effects that are way worse uh, than what Tylenol was pulled off the market for. Uh, you know they're they're supposed to be they're supposed to go through clinical trials, you know, for a year or two or three to see what kind of side effects you have. But pharmaceutical industries, um, drug companies are allowed to put them on the market way earlier. And then they have what's called a vaccine injury report system or something, uh, or you know, where you, you report side effects of vaccines and drugs and everything. Um, and the government's supposed to, the government's supposed to keep track of this. And so if, if they don't keep track, nobody nobody knows how many people are dying and they're saying, well, you had a heart attack or you had a stroke and it might have been caused by a reaction to the medicine, whatever it was. Now, on, um, just as a side note, all, all the pharmacists, every time when I go to the VA, you know, they always ask, well, if you're taking that medication, be sure you don't take these other two or it could be fatal. They'll interact with each other, right? There's just hundreds of medicines that will interact and give you a stroke or a heart attack or brain damage or something else in combination. You can take them separately and you're fine, but in combination, they're fatal. And so we, but the, we don't know that until you get a drug out on the market now because they're not testing them for years like they used to. It's, it's months. Yeah. And also, I read a book on medical ethics and there's beneficence and there's melanin. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Come, come up and talk about that. Late, not now. Not now. In, 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 in Bayer came from Germany, Nazi Germany, right? That came out of the bioweapon. Yep. Okay, who else has got another question? Um, I got one, Andy. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> considering all the conspiracies that you've been talking about, can you just elaborate a little bit on some of the latest evidence about 9-11 and what they found? No, please. Uh, yeah, well, I can summarize that in about a minute. Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, we are. I'll give you, give you a one minute summary. There's a book called The New Pearl Harbor, New Pearl Harbor Revisited. Uh, David Ray Griffin, professor from Claremont University in California, he wrote 14 books on the forensic evidence of 9-11. You don't need to have somebody's opinion or an update. The, the facts, the forensic evidence has been published. And a court case, uh, the whole case with the evidence has been given to the district, Southern District of New York, in New York, to put it, give it to a grand jury, to, to go after and prosecute the people in this country that orchestrated 9/11. That's how far along uh, the pursuit of truth on 9/11 is. But uh, the, the the court date, you know, the the officials, the judges, they're still dragging their feet because they don't want to admit that 3,000 people were murdered in New York by a coalition of Americans and others. It wasn't done by Muslims. Also, you only need to know one fact, one fact to understand this. Professor Griffin said it's 30 over seven. You get 30% open mind and a seventh grade education. You consider this one fact. Four buildings, not two, 
Four buildings were obliterated on 9-11. All seven were left as rubble. Four were reduced to rubble and there was nothing left. Three were left as standing rubble by the explosives that carved out half of the building and, and made them ready for demolition when the trucks moved in. So a total, a total of eight buildings, seven in New York, seven in New York and one at the Pentagon, eight buildings were prepped with explosives to give us the event known as New Pearl Harbor and to, to justify, justify the global oil, military oil coalition to make hundreds of billions, they make hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Not, not all, all the time. There, it's a trillion dollar a year, uh, you know, coalition between more, more than a trillion a year. It's huge money, and they, and they say those builders that sit, billionaires that sit on the board of directors of those companies, they sit on the board of directors of all the major media. That's why you don't hear about this. Okay. But as I said in the with the movie Spotlight, it's understandable that uh, you can't. Uh, people can't face the reality of what happened on 9-11, even with the evidence just overwhelming and non-debatable. It's just non-debatable. It's facts, period. Okay, uh, Charlie's got... All right, all right. Charlie's got his hand up. John, 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 Jonathan, John. okay. Jonathan, we'll get you. What do you got, Jonathan? In the 1990s, the Hang on, Communications Jonathan. Act was uh, instrumental in a lot of these issues. Could you uh, talk about how the loss of independent voices in our uh, mainstream media has contributed to not just us not having <coughs> discussion about this, but journalists don't even realize that there are certain questions that they have an obligation to ask. Well, uh, <clears throat> the fairness doctrine was gotten rid of in, I think, 1988, something like that. So by, by 1990, Fox News and Rush Limbaugh were well under the way you know, showering the public with criminally insane bullshit 24 seven. And since there's no fairness doctrine, the news programs are now, they're, they're dedicated to making a profit. You know, they, uh, it's entertainment. News, news is entertainment. It's not hard news anymore. And uh, it's thought that the American people have a short attention span. Yeah, so you, uh, there's no longer any real in-depth reporting going on, being reported on mainstream news. You see it in uh, the, the investigative reporters from like the Boston Globe or um, the Guardian in England. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll pay reporters to work on something that's not profitable. Just a, a story that should get out and the people, okay, people yeah. need to know. Dan, I, I'm Charlie. Are you since you had a question already? Another one. Dan and Lana is gonna can. Dan uh, has got a question else? next. Anybody That's okay. Oh, I, 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 we got we got time. All right, let's go to Dan and Lana first, and then we'll get to you, Don. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask a question. I'll ask a question. Why don't you show uh, yourself, and, Dan, if you can? Well, it's okay. I don't need to see him. Well, yeah, but it's okay. Go ahead, Dan. Andy, uh, good good talk. Uh, what is the thing wrong with the food system? What, say again, what's wrong with the food system? Yeah. What's wrong why, with food system? Why, do, why do farmers use so many pesticides? Well, far, farmers use pesticides, you know, it's a vicious circle. Farmers use pesticides to increase the yield. And then they get genetically engineered uh, seeds from Monsanto and the others that uh, you know will work good with that pesticide. Um, and it, um, the farmers are being pushed to use more fertilizers and pesticides that are manufactured to help increase the yield with these genetically engineered seeds. And um, it's a symbiotic relationship. I'm, I'm trying to think of, if you uh, call me next week, uh, I'll do some research and uh, yeah, so I've got some books on that, but they don't, the titles don't roll off the tip of my tongue. But basically what's happening is farming uh, with the uh, monoculture of farms, the soils are being depleted so that the food we're getting with these monocrops, the same crop for hundreds of acres, 
the food, the nutrition, the minerals and everything are not as strong as they were 50 years ago when the soil was deeper and richer. So the, the pesticides uh, and the fertilizers are gradually depleting soils of uh, big agribusiness and, and our, 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 the quality of our food, the nutrition of our food, nutritional value is going down. And a lot of, this is a lot of doctors uh, suspect this is why uh, we see a whole generation of you know obese young people coming up because they're not getting proper nutrition in the food anymore. Uh, but that that's that would be a subject for another whole talk uh, I could give if somebody wants to try to schedule or uh, put together. I'd, I'd share the podium with somebody and we work on it. Does that answer part of your question at all? Yeah, yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, do a Google, just do a Google search on uh, nutrition from farmland or something like that. Okay. And come up with a bunch of hits and books and everything. Okay. The subject okay. is well known all over the world. We're gonna go okay. to Don Ritchie, then uh, then we're gonna go to, Back to Don. Uh, oh, okay. What do you got, Don? All right, I wanted to ask you louder, louder, Don. Okay, okay. I can, I can hear you. I can hear you. All right, all right. Uh, I'm gonna take what you you wrote this, right? Yes. All right. I mean, if you wrote this, you wrote global solutions for the devastation of climate. One of the solutions that you advocate is universal vaccine drugs there for everyone, no exception. Now, by that, do you mean? That what you would like to see is, is that no states would be allowed to opt out of the Affordable Care Act? Is that what you're talking about? No, I get rid of the Affordable Care Act and go Medicare for all. Everybody. Oh, okay. Medicare for all. all right. Medicare for all would be basically the same as uh, the national health care in other countries. Okay. It's, it's funded by our tax dollars. Okay. Okay. So everybody, everybody starts from birth. Every, everybody just be covered from birth, period. Okay. Right. And, and, and it would save a lot of money over what our hospitals are scraping up on right now. The money wouldn't be going into the accounts of the billionaire predators I've been talking about. That's what we're talking about. Okay, Charlie, and then we're gonna hit you. Okay. All right, uh, show, you, show you my picture up there. <laughs> All right, if I'm correct, I just heard you say that, uh, Andy, on 9-11, that eight buildings were demolished by the use of explosives. Not demolished. Now, what? Not demolished. Only, only seven. Only seven were set for demolition. Okay, seven. Seven buildings. In now, from my understanding, in order to demolish a building using explosives, you have to put explosives around each and every column in the building. Now that means that uh, this would require a significant crew or crews of demolition experts, the cooperation of building managers, building property owners, and tenants, all of whom no one has to date, from my knowledge, has come forth in almost 25 years to say I participated in this activity. You have absolutely no one to corroborate this theory. Not one person, not even a deathbed confession, no one has come forth to say, I was a participant in this action. How come? Did you hear me say that the, the, the architects and engineers have sent the case to New York? For a grand jury. I want to know why no one has come forth to testify. Well, okay, if people don't come forward to testify that they killed 3,000 people, that, that's an instant uh, jail sentence for the rest of your life. Why would somebody come forward if they're free on a beach in Acapulco? Because he didn't make a million dollars by selling a book. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they can feel guilty. They can have a deathbed confession. Absolutely no one. Well, we, we don't know, Charlie. All, all we know is that four. I looked it up. There's no one. Oh, yeah. Where, 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 okay. I looked it up this afternoon. Charlie, you may, you may be 100% right. I accept that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the evidence. You're, you're you, have no one, you have no one to, to testify? Oh, yeah, right. They have to investigate. They have to investigate. We have, we have not had an investigation in 9-11 yet. They put it off for 22 years. 
That's why that's why they don't have any names yet. But they the the evidence of what was done. You know, the They're architects and engineers for truth have been investigating it for twenty five years. Well, they are. Some people have, and they they got the 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 case that went to the grand jury should be a slam dunk in New York. The evidence is overwhelming. Now they have to go after the people that did it and orchestrated it. That's what I'm talking about. No one, even in the government, I, I left out. You would require the cooperation of any number of federal employees. So out of all those people, it's probably hundreds of people. Not one person could say, I, I, I admit I'm sorry or guilt or anything. Not one person. Well, Charlie, Charlie, just ask yourself. Like 500 people. At if, least. If, if a guy's still alive, if, if a guy's not on his deathbed yet, you know, that's only 20 years away. Maybe none of these guys are on their deathbed yet, like the people that killed Kennedy. That was, you know, we had deathbed confessions uh, 40 years after Kennedy was killed. When About was that? Who was people. that? What? Who was that? Howard Hunt. I forget now, but you can look it up. Yeah, somebody uh, said they participated in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, okay. Yeah. They're, 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 and they gave the details? Charlie, we got to move on. They're, 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 I, I can get you the book, Charlie. Uh, one guy said they're. they're Give uh, me the name of the person. Howard Hunt. I, I don't have the name on me, Charlie. I don't carry thousands of names in my head. I'll get it for you if you want to make an issue of it, but you got to put up your five dollars. Go to the next question. All right, next one. Go ahead, make it loud, sir. We agree that the main cause of all these problems are overpopulation. I mean, in my lifetime, when I was born, there was approximately two and a half billion in the last year, I think it was at eight billion people. And we not have problems like this with agriculture pollution. Did you, what was your question about overpopulation? Well, uh, the question the question is uh, is is uh, our current state of affairs due to overpopulation? Well, to a certain degree, it is, but um, a large percentage of the world's population does not contribute a tenth or a twentieth per person for the destruction of the planet as the people in rich countries like the United States uh, that, that consume a lot, waste a lot. Uh, you know, for example, in our, our country, you know, future historians are going to look back on our country and say, what is this expressway with thousands of tons of cars burning fuel with one person each sitting in there? That That's insane. You know, you know we, if we go uh, there's all kinds of plans to go more efficient and on less resources and also the population in some places is declining. Uh, you know, some people think that overpopulation is a problem. I agree with you. Uh, if, if we only had a quarter of the people, we would have less pollution. Repeat the question. Well, uh, if you raise the standard, the, the standard of living is improving in a lot of third world places where they're getting electricity with a few solar panels on the roof and a small battery and some lights. They don't have to burn uh, wood or kerosene or anything for light. Uh, a lot of places are <clears throat> getting off of, they're getting away from having to import diesel oil or uh, fuel to run generators because solar panels are clean, cheap, and safe. Solar is way cheaper than running a generator virtually anywhere on the planet now. But there's Rocky Mountain Institute talks about this. There are uh, micro banks and things where they make micro loans to people 
so they can, you know, they can't afford $500 up front, but they could pay for it over a 10 or 12 year period or something and save $2,000, $3,000 in diesel oil trying to run a generator. But they need, they just need to get over the hump with the micro investment. That, that, that's kind of stuff that's going on all over the planet. Have you, uh, I, I forget your name, but Dean, have you logged on, logged on to Rocky Mountain Institute lately? I rest my case. Okay. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is the Rocky Mountain Institute is a wealth of hopeful information that everybody here should, every week you know, people should be coming here to explain, uh, just tell us the latest great tidbit you saw on Rocky Mountain Institute or one of those other sites. But Rocky Mountain, RMI.org is the premier site for publishing a list of beneficial stuff like this that's going on all over the planet. It's a huge resource and more hope. It, it answers a lot of your questions. Well, the, the cost the cost is less than running and continuing to burn fossil fuel. Let's put it that way. And then the banks are getting involved now in their investment banking and green technology because the cost, they're recognizing that the cost to keep polluting is uh, is a one-way ticket. I mean, they're, they're looking at 20, 30 degrees, feet, 40 feet of sea level rise in this century by 2050, 2060. At the present rate, we've got about five years to cut our fossil fuel consumption in half. With it, that could be a blend of efficiency, a blend of alternative fuels, a blend of electricity, but changing lifestyles, not flying so much to business, you know, uh, cutting down air traffic. There's all kinds of things that can be done to go more efficient and burn a whole lot less fossil fuel. Okay, Charlie's okay. got another Charlie question. Got another question? Yeah, of course. What is it, Charlie? Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. Okay, Andy, uh, you said the number two suppress story, suppress story of the year was on wage theft. However, in 2002, and it's now in its second edition, I believe it was a New York Times bestseller book called Nickel and Dime by Barbara Hellerick. And Barbara Ehrenreich. the New York Times. Now also, there was another book, and I have both of these in my labor library, um, called uh, Wage Theft by Kim Bobo, who is a president of an uh, employee association here in Chicago. Now people are publishing books on this topic. It's, I don't perceive how it's suppressed. Uh, what's the date of that nickel and dime book? 2002. 2002, and again, it was, it was the second edition came out. Okay, and how many people in the country you think read it? I believe it was the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, well, yeah. You know what was also you know what was also on the New York Times bestseller list, Charlie? For the nonfiction, the 2011 edition of Censored News. That was a New York Times bestseller for a few weeks because it had a whole chapter on the forensic evidence. You said this topic was suppressed, and it's not. He's just saying that you said the topic was suppressed and it wasn't. He's is Charlie's claim. Hey, Charlie, Charlie, just because it's covered here and there doesn't mean it's it's not censored. They're not they're not covering it to a degree that the public needs to reach critical mass on the subject. It's what we call non-coverage coverage. Oh, he said, oh, well, we covered that a while back, so we're not going to write about it again for ten years. When it should be wage step with all kinds of people uh, you know, right now is a tremendous problem in the United States. You said it was suppressed and it's for public people are publishing books. That's not suppression. Okay. Well, we do, we have a difference of opinion. Suppression uh, that's suppression, publishing a book is suppression. Next question, please. All right, Andy, I'd like to get your, uh, I know you've been kind of itching at the butt to talk about it and YouTube has relaxed its guidelines. Give us a brief summary of what you think about the COVID-19 epidemic and the vaccines. 
just briefly, and we don't want to get to a lot much. Yeah, Go ahead. I, I would point out uh, there's, there's there's two books. There's there's a book. There's two books by the same title. The Rise of the Fourth Reich was Jim Mars, published in around 2008. Basically, the Rise of the Fourth Reich is talking about the rise of the billionaires and uh, their connections with former Nazis and everything else. He said, imagine if the Nazis that got scattered all over the world and survived after World War II, imagine if they were coming back and coalescing into a different country. And, and uh, hoping to rise and up and make a fourth right. Well, he said, you don't have to imagine it. It's happening in America. And in the last year, I can't tell you how many articles have been written about the Nazi tendencies of Ted Cruz and some of these others, uh, Ron, De, Ron DeSantis in Florida. I mean, uh, just fascist tendencies, just, just like what came out of World War II. Nazi philosophy. Well, this book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, is new, 2023. It's the whole title. You might want it. This is an educational book that has a lot, a lot of stories in it from people around the world in the COVID epidemic. And it's called Confronting COVID Fascism with a New Nuremberg Trial so that this never happens again. The Rise of the Fourth Reich. And this book is loaded. The first chapter is the, like a lawyer presenting the case. They, they said, this is what a Nuremberg trial would look like to deal with the people that gave us this crime. And it is, it appears from what I'm seeing in other, other books too, it's the crime of the millennium. So uh, what, what, basically what they're saying, COVID, was uh, an energetic form of flu, but it's the first time, part of the crime is the first time in this country, doctors told people, go home until you get sick enough to come to the emergency room. They didn't treat them early on with treatments, uh, cheap available medicines that have been used for 20 years all over the world. We had the highest death rate per thousand people, more or less, of any modern country on the planet because the pro protocol in America was wait until you get sick enough, then go into the hospital, then the hospitals get paid so many thousands of dollars per day per bed over a normal sick patient. The hospitals made a bundle on COVID. And when uh, there, there are stories here that would just break your heart about people that hired a lawyer, there were people that were successful and got their father or son-in-law or whoever it was that had COVID, they were able to get them out of the COVID, COVID care unit in a hospital before he died. And then they found an alternative doctor that was able to give them the medicine that would cure them. And they, they, our country has been going right after doctors that have been using affordable, available medicines that have been used for the last 20, 30 years for all kinds of things. Well, that was all suppressed at the start. We were told there's no treatment for COVID until Pfizer got their new uh, you know, drugs out. Well, 57,000 pages of Pfizer documents were released by a court order, Freedom of Information Act, and it's a slam dunk for crime. Uh, big lawsuits are coming up to fight against Pfizer. That's why today, right today, there's no real mandate in the military to get COVID child vaccinations anymore. That's so nonsense. You, you're, you're twisting things around. So that's, think, that's not correct. I'm, I'm, I'm reporting what's being reported by these other doctors, Charlie. If you want to take exception to it, then read the book yourself. There's a reason why there's no mandate. It has nothing to do with the efficiency of the cure. Let, let Charlie speak. He's making a good point. Go ahead, Charlie. That, the, the fact of the mandate is a, is a legal matter. It has nothing to do with the efficacy of the, of, of the COVID uh, treatment. Okay, well, my, the point I was making was a, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, many, many businesses were telling people you couldn't work here unless you got vaccinated. Now, and, and the decision, Andy, was 
did the Department of Labor have the authority to mandate it? They did not get into whether the, the, the cure was good or bad. It was whether or not the government had the authority to mandate it. They did not weigh the plus or minus of the medicine. I, um, that was the issue. Well, the issue the issue has changed, Charlie. So if, if you're not aware of it yet, I suggest I can give you some information you want, or I, I suggest you buy a copy of this book yourself because you can afford it. It's I served on the history. COVID committee for the government. I know what the issue was. Does the authority of the government, the employer have the authority to mandate something? It didn't examine the something. It's whether or not you had the authority. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie uh, the, the hospitals, the hospitals nationwide prevented loved ones from visiting their people while they were dying in the treatment rooms. And that, that's been documented. People, people were waiting outside in windows. They had a birthday card or something. They weren't allowed to go into the hospital. And we, we've never, never really seen conditions like this. And now the fraud of that is being talked about in several books that have emerged. It was not a transmissible disease. You say it wasn't a transmissible disease. How did people get it then? Uh, yeah, well, that's not, Charlie, I can't debate that with you now. Uh, this isn't this is the time you want to debate. Come in in person, Charlie. We'll have a debate. Yeah, I, I'll just tell you right now, it's a transmissible disease. Okay, anyway. All right, I think. Come this, on, Andy. All right, Charlie and Andy. All right, now I, I just asked for a little bit of a summary of the stuff. We've gotten our summary. Charlie, thank you for bringing up the points today that you thought Andy was going wrong with. And uh, now I think it's time to go to rebuttals. And uh, Andy, go ahead, Andy. One, uh, one final, I, I didn't get the, the final uh, book. There, if you wanna know what's happening with COVID uh, in the medical industrial complex, these two books describe that. One of them is called The Real Anthony Fauci. It gives, it gives you the uh, whole history of how Anthony Fauci managed the AIDS epidemic and the death toll back in the 80s. He knew, they absolutely knew they were killing people. There's no doubt about it. This one, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, is new. Well, they're both new last year or so. Okay. And this one, they just, they're, they're loaded with stories of doctors and hospitals they were curing people all over the country after other hospitals gave up and said, you're gonna die. I mean, we, we've been lied to big time about the COVID. We were lied to about everything that happened during the COVID epidemic. I agree with Charlie, it's probably something infectious, but you don't, the treatment doesn't have to be fatal. That, that's what these doctors are saying. I've got one more question. Do you mean to tell me that there's a, a causal link between smoking and lung cancer? Well, Oh, that's all big conspiracy. I'm kidding. Here. Like, what can I say? I'm being facetious. Little comedic. So, take a deep breath. All right, let's go to rebuttals, guys. Okay, who got, who's got rebuttals? That's who's got rebuttals, and let's go. And okay, uh, all right, Jonathan, will go first. We'd like. Sid, I know you're going to be sitting. We'll bring the mic to you. Yeah, I'll uh, bring the stack of books up. Okay, Jonathan, we're going to give each of you guys about three to four minutes. Anybody who wants to rebut from the audience, please raise your hand or let me know through the chat if you don't know how to do it, Lorenz. I know I see you there. I hope you'll uh, be able to rebut with us tonight. Uh, give us a rebut. I hope you'll pipe in, Lorenz. It's nice to see you tonight. All right, Jonathan, give me about two, give, get your two or three minutes in there and uh, make sure you're speaking to the mic so we can hear everybody can hear you out in the uh, Zoom audience. Thank you, Andy. Uh, you talked about Smedley Butler tonight. Uh, he wrote a book called War is a Racket, How Industrialists Generated Enormous Profits from War and Mass Human Suffering. Uh, Smedley revealed the existence of a political conspiracy that was plotted by business owners and financiers to overthrow President Franklin Roosevelt in 1933. Uh, these businessmen and these uh, 
financiers tried to recruit Smedley Butler to overthrow President Roosevelt and install what Smedley described as a fascist regime. And there's, there's a quote by Smedley that goes, there are only two things we should fight for. One is the defense of our homes and the other is the Bill of Rights or for any other reason is simply uh, a racket. Um, there, there are warning signs that maybe uh, what Sheldon Woolen calls inverted totalitarianism through the form of a coup has already happened. And here's some warning signs that you might recognize. Number one warning sign that maybe it's already happened, powerful and continuing nationalism. Uh, how many people here have witnessed that in America? Yeah. Number two is disdain for human rights. Has anybody uh, found evidence of that in the United States? Another one is an identification of enemies as a unifying cause. Yeah. 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 Right. Next one on the list of warning signs is supremacy of the military. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next one is <coughs> rampant misogyny. The next one is controlled mass media, which I asked yeah. Andy about at the uh, Q&A session uh, referring to the Telecommunications Act, which was a bipartisan act in uh, the 90s, so over two and a half decades ago. Next one is obsession with national security. Next one is religion and government intertwined. The next warning sign is corporate power protected. The next warning sign is labor power suppressed. Next warning sign is disdain for intellectuals and artists. The next warning sign is obsession with crime and punishment. The next warning sign is rampant cronyism and corruption. The next warning sign is fraudulent elections. The next warning sign is denial that extreme pollution is real or often referred to as ecocide, especially climate change. And the next warning sign, absolute lack of respect for accessibility, independent living, and disability community rights. Vice President Henry Wallace, Roosevelt's vice president, our uh, Midwest's own Henry Wallace in April of 1944 said this to conclude. They claim to be super patriots, but they would destroy every liberty guaranteed by the constitution. They demand free enterprise, but are the spokespersons for monopoly and vested interest and their final objective toward which all their deceit is directed is to capture political power so that using the power of the state and the power of the market simultaneously, they may keep we the workers in eternal subjection. Thank you, Andy, for a good talk. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right, it's good to be back. You know, I haven't been to the College of Complex in a long time. And um, I did want to uh, say a few things about uh, what's been said so far. Uh, first of all, Andy talked about the Tylenol incident back in the 80s. Uh, I was, um, I, don't know, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that, but I actually do. Uh, that was, uh, I was in high school back then when that happened. Um, I want to say that the Tylenol incident, saying that the company behaved conscientiously, um, the, the company manufacturing Tylenol behaved conscientiously about that. I mean, that, yeah, but that's an easy one because they they weren't responsible. It was a lone nut that was poisoning the capsules on his own. It wasn't the corporation making a decision to put out a dangerous product. Uh, and and see when it's when it's when it you know when it's a car company that knows a car is dangerous and they put it out anyway, or somebody who knows, makes a drug that's dangerous and they sell it anyway. That's that's a completely different thing. And then they're gonna you know, fight like the devil to avoid liability, because then they're liable. But when it's some nut, without their knowledge or permission, poisoning uh, uh, capsules, that's that's a different matter, and they're not. You know. So, okay. Now, on the second thing, on the subject of childhood obesity that Andy brought up, uh, yeah, childhood obesity is increasing. Now, obesity in general is a growing problem, uh, pun intended, uh, in, especially in this all over the world, actually, but especially here in the United States. Uh, we're, we're much further along in that regard than most other countries. 
Um, and the people who have studied this in depth have concluded that this is, they, they found that the more fat you eat, the more likely you are to get fat. You know, you are what you eat. And the interesting thing is that Americans don't actually eat the most fat of, of uh, people in the world. For example, the French actually eat, have more fat in their diet than other people, like the Greeks, for example, other people in Europe, who actually eat more fat than Americans. This includes the children, but they're less obese. Why is that? Well, what they, what they studied, this is what they found out, that it's because we get less exercise than, than people in Europe or even Canada or even Australia. Uh, and, and the reason we get less exercise is because we are more dependent on automobiles. We're more dependent on, on, on driving around in our SUVs uh, than, than anybody else on planet Earth. Uh, and because of our, and, and, and as for the kids, kids are less likely to get phys ed class because you, you can't, can't test a person's knowledge of phys ed with a bubble test. Uh, there isn't any way of, 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 of having somebody do a bubble test, do a standardized test, and then run run it through run it through a machine and and see how high their score was so that whether the school can get its funding or not. They only test for reading, writing, and arithmetic for that. All right now, um, all right now on the subject of control of the mass media. Yeah, the mass media is consolidated, but only if you ignore the internet. Because when you go on the internet, you will find you will find some. There's probably more websites now than there are people on the earth. Uh, it's just like an infinite number. It's a Google of websites, literally. Yeah. You know, and there's and everybody, anybody, anybody can put out their own website. Well, there's a member of the College of Complexes who I think he, this fellow right here, he puts out his own website. So uh, and and uh, uh, Tim, you got your own website, right? Right. Anybody now, can yeah. put out their own website. Anybody can be a publisher now. And 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 so it's actually become more democratic. It's open to everybody. Um, and, and more and more people are getting their news from there. Now, the people who grew up in the days when I Love Lucy was still on the air, still tend to get their news from the television like they were doing back in the 50s when they were younger. But the people, the people who were born after, the in, after everybody had a computer in their home, let's say the, the millennials, are much more likely to get their news off the internet. And there it's wide open. It's everybody. There's no, it isn't three big networks. It's it's 10,000 million billion uh, uh, channels. You know, you can get your news from anybody. This is, and by the way, this is why there's this plethora of conspiracy theories flying around. Oh, there's no such thing as AIDS. Oh, 9-11 is a, is a myth. Oh, the, 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 the uh, what else? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the school shootings are, are, are a myth. It's, it's crisis actors. You, you get, all these websites uh, proliferate because they're, there ain't no editor on these people. It's often a one-man operation. Or the election was stolen. Oh, yeah, 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 whatever election. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so our problem right now isn't censorship. Our problem is the lies that proliferate uh, in, uh, on the Internet. All right, that's all I have to say. Now. All right, who's next? All right, Sid, you want to? Okay, can you hand up? Can you hand him the microphone? He's going to hand you the microphone, Sid. And he's going to hand you the microphone. And we'll get you next, Charlie, after Sid. Okay, Lawrence. Yeah, I know. And then we're going to get Sid, and then we'll get uh, Charlie, then we'll get Ellen. Actually, about 10% of the world's population <coughs> is the ones that are polluting the world. And these people, they don't just get on a bus, they have their own car, and they go different places, and they use up a lot of gas, stay away. A lot of them have their own planes. Let's say they have Mardi Gras in Rio. Well, they, they say, I want to enjoy, enjoy myself. I'll go to Rio. Or they got a boat, which uses up tremendous amount of gas. So that's all they use up. That's the, the 10%. I usually the Catholics who have the wealth to do that. A lot of other things are happening. People, if they watch the news, let's say at 530, what do they tell you? They never mention global warming. Never. 
I, I watch the news. I never hear it. Why it doesn't exist? If you put on the news, they'll tell you that it's getting extremely hot in the South or in, in Chicago or New York City, but they never mention global warming. That's the problem. Why? Because the oil industry has such a tremendous power, they avoid it. Otherwise, they will lose a lot of revenue. And that's what they care about, is revenue. So they never mention it. So anybody that tells you, I watch the news and I know what's happening, it's ridiculous. They never mention things that are not favorable to them. For instance, I watch Democracy Now. It's on Channel 3 at 12 o'clock at night. She came on and she talked about her food in Latin America and Honduras. If you watch the news, the mainstream news, they never mention it. Never. So it's a waste of time to even watch it. It's like somebody teaching you a bunch of lies or they omit things. That's what happens. Okay. Uh, Charlie, I'm going to have Ellen go next and then we'll let you go after her, okay? Fine. Okay. All right, go ahead, Ellen. You got three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, Andy, uh, Andy's one of my favorite people. He's the reason I come back here all the time. And, uh, you know, we share books and uh, we've got to do more of this. And, you know, free speech is the key. We, you know, I have to address Don's idea. Don actually and, with, and uh, Doug were the two that told me about the college and, you know, um, as a free speech forum, that's, I'm like, that's what we need. This is the only one I know of. And, but the key thing is it has to be completely uncensored. And it, you know, for three years, the vaccine word is, has been censored. So the smartest guys, this guy, Sukarit Bagdi, microbiologist, and along with Arl Bukart, uh, back they were they had the Nuremberg 2.0. It's a case for you know proving you just end this pandemic. I tried to end the pandemic. I've got it written up. Maybe I can give this presentation. This is in April 2021, uh, but I wasn't allowed to do it here. I, this you know, but Bukart is still on. They looked at 12 dead people who had gotten vaccine and they found, you know, without, it's, it's in, it clings to the epithelial cells. This, we knew this from the AIDS in the nineties, Lynn Horowitz was writing about this. And, you know, all these books going back to the eighties, the nineties, it's in the microbiology of it. We can't let this be a matter of even the epidemiologists, you, you know, you can say there's sudden deaths and it, came after the, you know, the vaccines or not before the vaccines. You can argue about descriptive statistics, but the truth is, I know as a research analyst of four courses in statistics at the graduate level, a market researcher has done a million dollars with the market research studies. You start with the qualitative, the hypothesis, and, you know, it's like, okay, this is a good vaccine, but that had to depend on whether it was a good vaccine. All you need is one bad vaccine that, which these are, uh, that kills. I mean, you look at the history back in the, the summer of 63, John F. Kennedy Oswald was down at the Tulane Oxner Clinic developing a killer vaccine with, in order to kill Castro. And they tested, they did it by taking a mouse, they'd inject a cancer in it, they pull it out, grind it up, put it into the mouse again, kept putting it in. They made this killer cancer. And then they're, they're, this is great. Let's see how fast we can kill a, a, a 
uh, this guy at Angola prison. They went over there, shot at him. He died within minutes. Like, this is the perfect weapon. We'll kill off Castro and save the world from communism. This is the way our crazy Nazi fascist military industrial complex is. I was what I was going to say is you look at medical ethics and we assume that it's all beneficent, but it's not. It's all maleficent. I mean, it's designed to population control. This is an old trick of empire. We are American empire. Look at Howard Zinn's book, The American History of American Empire, People's History. It's better than the regular people's history because it shows, you know, we brought the Nazis that Alan Dulles got Mengele, took him down to Venezuela along with Barbie and put him there and they were developed the dirty wars. And, and you know, I'll kill 20,000 over here. We got to torture them first. We'll kill another 20,000. This is, it's called genocide. Why, why doesn't our UN prosecute genocide? Well, they just call it ethnic cleansing and it's okay. But if you look at the real history, the untold history, this is who we are. And if we can't talk about it here, and if it's not allowed on Facebook, because Facebook's corporate, and so that makes First Amendment doesn't apply. They, Charlie's constitutional interpretation of rights is that it, it only applies to government censorship. Well, guess what? The CIA is government, and they created Facebook and Google and the internet, and they don't get to censor us. And so if, if you say, oh, well, let's censor ourselves then, because that way we won't get kicked off of Facebook, that's insane. They've taught us to self-censor, right? And they're all the smartest people and the smartest doctors have, are organizing, but they're not on the internet. You don't know about it. So science can't develop the right things. Okay, and Doug is over there with chronic fatigue because that's what it caused. Lyme disease was made at Fort Detrick. It's all of these are the same thing. Long COVID, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, you know, and it's sad. And it also gives you dementia and you can't even understand that vaccines are killing us and we can't even understand it. All right, Charlie, you're next. Thank you, Ellen. Charlie, you're next. All right. Uh... I want to thank Andy for a nice presentation and for bringing in literature. I'll cover three subjects here. Uh, number one, uh, I think we've heard for the last time that dozen or so theories that are advanced about 9-11. There's been no new variation of the story. Uh, it didn't pass the test of truth uh, the first time. and. Uh, Historical events usually, uh, if there's any new information regarding it, it has not been come out whatsoever, which is a little unusual if you look at it as a historical episode. So it's not likely to come out. Uh, unfortunately, you have no one to verify the accuracy of the dozen or so theories that you advance, such as directed energy weapons, on the Twin Towers and other bizarre things that I've heard here at the college. Number two, uh, you should stand corrected, sir. You said oil is subsidized. It's been mentioned several times at the college. In fact, that um, the price of a, gas, a gallon of gasoline in the United States without government subsidy would be something like 12 or $15. Uh, the worst thing that could happen politically to anyone in office is for the price of gasoline to go above five or six dollars. So, uh, yes, we are focused on the automobile, as Don Ritchie folk mentioned, um, and any increase in the price of oil at the pump uh, is, is uh, countered by the government in any fashion. That's not a new thing. Those of us in, in public transit, we, we've known that uh, subsidies for the automobile has been in progress for many, many years. There's things on our website regarding that. Now, last of all, I've heard for the last, first of all, we heard from Andy many years ago, there was no N1, H1N1 epidemic. Then he showed up and said there was no AIDS epidemic. Now he shows up and says there's no COVID epidemic. 
Well, sir, yes, there are epidemics. And there's a response by the public health and the medical community to counter these. And they do what is caged in. Perhaps you're not aware of the concept. It's called best practices. Uh, our, when you go to a doctor and he prescribes a treatment, he is engaged in best practices. Do they, in fact, all work with 100% efficacy, such as uh, AIDS? There is no cure for AIDS. So, uh, yes, there was trial and error. Anyone familiar with the operation of health uh, would realize that. But you apparently have no credentials or experience in the health world, as well as the other person I heard speak. Now, there are appropriate topics for public discussion by qualified personnel. There are other ones that are potentially hazardous. Now, if you want to practice medicine without a license, I suggest you open an office someplace. But don't come here and start uh, making pronouncements regarding the healthcare policy of this nation or the community. Until you're such as you get some some measurable credentials to speak on the topic. Okay. Um, no, it's, 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 uh, don't you have any responsibility that you may cause harm to people who listen to you? You have no sense of ethics. Okay, Charlie, let me wait, go. Wait, no, I'm not finished. They have no sense of ethics regarding the potential harm that could result by advancing certain concepts of which they have no qualifications to speak of. Now, I suggest that you curb these actions in this regard. And I hope this is the last time we've heard these things that denial that there are serious illnesses that are affecting the people. There are something like 38 to 75 million people on the planet with AIDS. Okay. It's a serious situation. And we, if anything, the governments of the United States okay. are doing their best to try to eliminate it. All right, Charlie, to recognize we that. Charlie, we got it. We got to move on. Okay, Dave, you're next. Three minutes. Charlie, what about six? So we can. Okay, David, go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank Andy for a very fine talk.